Uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, large win uh, down in Tampa, 33-16. to They really take it to the Eagles. Man, speaking of teams that were able to put their foot on the gas immediately to start a game, that is what the Buccaneers were able to do, and the Eagles just were not able to claw their way back in this one. Take a look at the Bucs' top five graded players on the day. Future Hall of Famer, linebacker Levante David at the very top for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at a 90.4. Cornerback Jamel Dean right behind him with an 86.1. Edge rusher Yaya Diaby says yay on there, but, you know, it could just be a celebration for the day that he had. That's my bad, by the way, guys. I forgot the other A when I was typing that in. Uh, 77.9 overall grade in this one. Cornerback Tyke Smith is 75.7. And then cornerback Zion McCollum as well with a 75.1. Three corners there in the top five for the Bucs. Look at that Todd Bowles cornerback room. Baker Mayfield would have been on that list. 86.9. We weren't separating the quarterbacks there. And then when you go to the Philadelphia Eagles, offensive tackle Jordan Mailata with a 79.9. Running back Saquon Barkley with a 76.8. Edge rusher Josh Sweat with a 75.6. Tight end Dallas Goddard with a 73.4. Edge rusher Brandon Graham with a 71.4. And then quarterback Jalen Hurts, another tough day for Hurts. 51.3. It just feels like Todd Bowles has Jalen Hurts in this Eagles offense number over the last three seasons. Uh, what did you think the stat that told the story was here, Dalton? So... I last week we talked about Philadelphia going down to New Orleans getting that win and I thought they had the best gate defensive game plan of the week uh this week I'm not really sure what they were doing they would just seem like they got back to basics and they were sitting in zone coverage and and they I guess they were trying to mimic what Denver did to Tampa last week but Denver also has a Patrick Sertan that can shadow Mike Evans, and it's kind of a different way that they operate it with Vance Joseph. But for me, the number is the Bucks had 190 yards after the catch. Okay, I, that was something I felt early in the game, and Mayfield was great, and he made a lot of he made several great throws throughout the game. But I thought early in this game, it felt like the Bucks just getting the ball to their playmakers and letting them work, and, and just kind of going underneath underneath these zone coverages and attacking them with the ball in their hands, right? And, and that 190 yards after the catch, over the past two years, since the start of last year, what's the only game where they had more than that? Playoff game against Philadelphia mm. when they had, when they had uh, 210, okay? And, and, and it just – it just seems to be a theme on offense too where it's like okay we know we know how to attack these guys just get them after the catch and we'll figure it out and the other one too and again i think this started early in this game they had 136 yards after the catch in the first half very clear plan whoever it was whether it was godwin or or the backs or trey palmer whoever underneath just get it to them and we'll just work in space right we don't want jalen carter against against a relatively young um uh, you know, a, a young offensive line inside mm-hmm. for the Bucks. We still got our backup right tackle in. Let's just get the ball out and we'll and we'll play kind of seven on seven. We'll get out there. But 136 yards after the catch in the first half, looked that up. That's the second most that since 2006, since PFF started, the second most that the Bucks have had in a first half. And the first the first game was that was in 2007. So you're talking about it's been 17 years since this team had this many yards after catch in the first half. They just came out early. And they established, okay, you're going to sit back in zone, and we're not going to throw into the teeth of it. We're going to let our – we got some really good athletes on this team. We're going to let them work in space, and we're just going to work down the field. And that's what worked. Obviously, Todd Bowles and his defense shut down the Eagles too. They got off to as slow a start as you could get off to. But right. but the Bucks came in with a clear plan. Then when the Eagles start coming up, then Mayfield starts making some vertical throws and doing some different things, and it was just a shred fest from there. But that's that's the part to me where it's like the Bucks. They just let – they got a great group of skill players. You got two good backs in there. Bucky Irving's coming along now big time. I think he had the same number of carries this week as Rashad White. You've got guys who can make plays on the outside, and that's where the Bucks won this game was out on the perimeter. You know, I, I agree with you, and I'll, I'll sort of expand that. I think the Bucks won this game, and they're winning this season on early downs because when you look at the last three years for this team, uh, certainly if you, you take the clock back two years, Byron Lefwich was – bad on first and second down like they really could not figure it out they had no rhythm they were running the ball in disadvantageous situations like they'd throw it on first down they, they'd they either start every it felt like for a while they were starting every drive just running the football because it feels like that's sort of what Todd Bowles is wanting that's his identity but then they really couldn't run the ball very well so then they were behind the sticks and you know you get in like second and nine situations and then it's just really not a good uh, series there for you or 
they'd pass the ball, and if it was an incomplete pass, they'd go, well, okay, well, we just passed it, so now we have to run. And then they'd run the football, and they'd get, you know, two, three yards, and all of a sudden it's, it's third and seven, third and eight. Well, okay, well, what are you doing? You're putting your team behind the eight ball before you even get to third down. You're not even trying to get first downs at this point. You're just trying to get to manageable situations. They didn't really handle it well under Byron Leff, which is last year on those early down, those first and second downs. And it felt like it was a journey last year as well with Dave Canales. There were times when the game plans were nice when it came to early down work, but there were too many head scratching times. And and you could say to yourself, well, Canales is still trying to figure it out. He was a first time play caller. The team wasn't exactly what it needed to be, especially on the interior offensive line when it comes to running the football. They were not good in that area up front. So you want to give him a little bit of grace because sure, you don't want to just completely abandon the run, but when you do run, the offensive line's not good enough. There were a lot of excuses there. The interior offensive line and the offensive line in general, I think, is better this year. The passing weapons are better in this year. But straight up, Liam Cohen is just better this year. Their offensive coordinator. The Bucks have been very good on those early downs, especially yesterday. When you look at how they were playing against the Eagles, and I know people in the chat, they're talking about Vic Fangio and how the scheme is trash and they're bad. But I do want to give credit to Mayfield and Liam Cohen in this one. And the last stat that I'm going to mention sort of goes into, okay, well, it doesn't really matter who they were playing. They just knew their opponent very, very well. When you look at early down, so first and second down, they have an 89, they had an 89.9 passing grade yesterday against the Eagles. Fourth highest EPA per pass on early downs, but also the fourth highest EPA per play. So even when they weren't passing the football, this was a good team that knew what they were doing. Two big time throws and zero turnover worthy plays with an 85.3 adjusted completion percentage. I was watching something the other day. I cannot remember where I was watching it. Apologies for this. But somebody was talking about how Patrick Mahomes does not take negative plays on first down. He will not do it. He won't take negative plays on Thursday. And the early down work that Patrick Mahomes does to especially avoid negatives and get completions is a reason why the Chiefs feel like they're in so many confident and advantageous second and third down situations. When you look at an 85.3% adjusted completion percentage and zero turnover where he plays for Baker Mayfield, that tells me that is what they are doing. They're not taking negative plays, especially on first down. And when you look at the time to throw... Fastest time to throw in the NFL this week at a 2.08. That means that Baker Mayfield knew exactly where the ball was going immediately before the ball was even snapped. That to me, again, is just praise for, I don't want, and I don't say this to take away from Baker Mayfield, that's praise to Liam Cohen and what he's doing as the offense coordinator. This group is confident. They know what they're doing. They have a plan when they go out there. It's not just, Hey, okay, all right, well, let's try to run it on this first down. It, it, there's a there's a reason for what the Bucks are doing, and that reason is working for them. And you clearly saw that yesterday on early down work. I think that's an encouraging part moving forward this season. Yeah, I think I think look, Liam Cohen to me was the big X factor for the Bucks season this year because I, I, I personally I thought Canales did a solid job last year. There was adjustments that had to be made mid year, and then he kind of found the groove, and it was a little bit like this this kind of perimeter ball control passing to set up the run. You mentioned okay, the Bucks, you know, even when they ran it, they were solid. Solid. I thought all the runs in this game were very, very well timed too. I, I just think they they caught the Eagles in fronts that they wanted to catch them in. They ran when they needed to. They ran in in good situations when they had two way goes. I, 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 you're right. It was a great. It was a well called game. And, and I think a game plan like this, where look, there's times when we know Mayfield wants to throw it vertically. We want to get down the field, course, right? Right. But this is this type of adjustment and that much of a game plan and it working that well. It goes. It goes in all week. This. This was. This was obviously the product of. Okay, since last. Since Tuesday, they were going. Okay, we're going to throw it quick. We're going to throw it short, and the athletes are going to win today, right? Mm-hmm. And then we'll set up vertical shots and stuff like that later. So you're. You're absolutely right. And to me, the biggest question I had was, can we go from Canales to Cohen and have that same success? And they're absolutely doing it. I mean, we've seen it. In, we've seen it in two of their games where they've looked just spectacular, and the other two games, I think it was something, especially after last week with Denver, where. That's what Denver wanted them to do. Mm-hmm. The Bucks wanted to get vertical, and Denver wouldn't let them, and they didn't have these adjustments. I think this is a really, really good bounce back for their offense and just the number of different things they can do with all their weapons. Uh, most impressive. Who you got? Trev, you're from Tampa Bay. You're a Bucks fan. Been at your whole life, right? Yeah, this is true. There's three constants in Tampa. Death, taxes, and Levante David. Amen, that's there is, just, brother. That's just the way it is. A 90.4 overall grade. Eight tackles, two sacks, including the strip sack that really put the game away. 
five pressures as a blitzer. He's, he's getting to have fun as a blitzer, I think, more than ever in his career now. Also a pass breakup, also four defensive stops. Still one of the best linebackers in the league. He's just ageless. Yeah. It, it, it's incredible what he keeps doing. And there, there may not be a player with less individual accolades, at least on paper, that, that deserves to make the Hall of Fame. Just, I, I mean, the fact that it, has he made, what, one or two Pro Bowls, if that? Has he ever made a Pro Bowl? He no, I think he's made one, uh, maybe that, two now. That uh, he, whichever it is, that's a shame because this guy. I mean, if it, you know, they say people say it all the time. If he wasn't on all those bad Bucks teams that didn't make the playoffs for however long, he'd be a easy Hall of Famer, and he should be anyway. He's made two second team All Pros in 2016 and 2020. He made one first team All Pro in 2013. Didn't even make the Pro Bowl that year. Uh, and the only year that he made the Pro Bowl was 2015, and that was not even any of the years that he got an all pro nine. so uh, basically no one's uh, no one watched him because he's in tampa it, that's pretty, he's at a hall that's fame pretty much it and he's and he's been one of the best linebackers in the league for what 14 years now is it 13 14 years 2011 i think it is yeah i, I mean he's, he's one of the best players of this generation and he just keeps doing it and he keeps signing one-year deals and he keeps honestly being arguably their best defense player uh my most impressive I knew you were going to talk about Levante David, so I was going to give that to you. I'm going to go with Vita Vea. I, I know the overall PFF grades were not great. Some Bucks fans were kind of tweeting about that this morning. But he did have the highest uh, run defense grade on third and fourth down when it came to all of their interior defense, or just all of their defensive linemen in general, which is what Vita Vea does best. And so even though it was kind of like a couple of splash plays, and you know, we, we grade these plays you know, as, as in, in totality, his overall grade was a little bit lower, but the impact was still there on the third and fourth downs that mean a lot, especially in run defense, which you're talking about a lot of goal line situations, a lot of third and short situations. You're going up against a team that does the tush push very, very well, and so it's tough to stand out in that regard, but Vita Vea still was able to do it. Um, he still gave you the splash plays that you love to see. My most disappointing, before we get to your most disappointing, Nick Sirianni. We, I see people in the chat talking about Nick Sirianni and just the coaching staff of the Eagles in general. I mean... Could not have been less inspired, it feels like, coming out of this game. And and this is a game where you had a lot of different question marks. You won a game in New Orleans last week that was sort of tough to pinpoint. Like, okay, this was very tangible for you moving forward. And you really wanted to start this game well. And it just they were flat on their face in both categories. They are bottom 10 in the league in terms of EPA per play. So on the offensive side of the ball this, this is for this week. And they were bottom 10 in EPA per play allowed as well. So they were a bottom 10 team in EPA per play, in the EPA per play metric on both sides of the football. And I think that gets even worse when you split it up between the first half and the second half. So to have your team come out as flat as they have was really, really disappointing. Um, you knew Tampa was going to look for a bounce back. You needed a lot more from your guys. I, I get it. And you're about to talk about this in a second. No Devontae Smith, no AJ Brown. It's rough. It's tough, right? I mean, like those are those are two of your 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 biggest names, the guys that are big time playmakers for you. Everybody's got injuries. Everybody's going through it. Look at the Chargers last or this past week, right? I mean, they got to, the Chargers have injuries to everybody. They're 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 playing hurt. Joey Bosa is not in there. Joel, Rayshon Slater, you know, like Justin Herbert's hurt. Like all of these guys are playing hurt and they're out. And what do the Chargers do? They take the Chiefs down to the wire because Jim Harbaugh is a good coach. And I just I'm, I was looking for so much more for Sirianni because if the win loss record starts to tick in the other direction for the Eagles, those voices against Sirianni, unfortunately because of how last year ended as well, are going to get real real loud. And this was a disappointing performance for him. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the way last year ended, is because you know rematches, especially when they're so close to the previous game um, are, are so much about coaching. And, and when you really look at it, you've got th this game they just played. They all, and then the loss in the wild card round last, uh, last year. That's only four games ago. And we essentially watched the same game twice. Yeah. There was nothing about this game that looked any different. You, I could see Todd Bowles making adjustments even on defense, whereas in – in the playoff game, he sent zero blitz at Jalen Hurts constantly. And in this game, he was showing it and then dropping some guys out and showing different looks. Like Todd Bowles and the Bucks staff came ready with changes, even though they won the game. They dominated that game. And it's actually easier to fall asleep when you win a game like that and you have a rematch coming and going, okay, well, let's just do the same things. And the Bucks made the adjustments and the Eagles didn't. It, it, we watched the same game that we watched in the wild card round last year even with two new coordinators, and, yep. and you just go, yep. okay, so, you know, and again, most disappointing, look, it is the Eagles wide receivers, 
And I, it, like you mentioned, life is hard. Life is hard without A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. You're, two, you're down your two best receivers, but you got to make something of it. And I know Dallas Goddard had a buck 70 last week. We're not gonna, we can't expect him to do that again. So, look, I, you know, they traded for Jahan Dotson. It seemed kind of weird on both sides when they did it. Not much going on. You've got Jahan Dotson and Paris Campbell and Johnny Wilson, all these guys getting shots. You know, and, and I get it. They shouldn't be expected to produce at a crazy level, but they had seven catches for 34 yards. So, I mean, so we lose Brown and Smith, and we just can't function – at all it seems it just seems odd to me especially if you fall behind and you know you can't just rely on Saquon Barkley and and Dallas Goddard and things like that they you know this was a problem even with Brown and Smith I I kind of had the question the entire offseason I go okay who's the other guy who's the third guy because usually teams now look you're in 11 personnel most of the time Mm -hmm. right they don't have a third guy and now without Brown and Smith they don't even have a first and second guy so I, I you can't just be dead in the passing game either especially in a game that you fell behind. So, um, no, it's a tough day for the Eagles. And right now, we haven't seen a lot of signs that this year is different from the second half of last year. 